let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, DeepRob. Uh, today is guest lecture two. And we have uh, Moit Sridhar, who is a PhD student from University of Washington, Seattle, where he works with Professor Dieter Fox. Uh, before that, uh, Mohit um, worked with David Su. Uh, he's a faculty at National University of Singapore. So Mohit is interested uh, in AI robotics in the intersection of human-robot interaction, computer vision, NLP, pretty much everything in the space. And he has done some amazing work uh, in the intersection of uh, perception, grasping, robot manipulation. And uh, uh, it's my great pleasure to have him here to talk to us and share his research. So without further ado, Mohit, take it away. Thank you for the kind introduction, Ikarthik. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here presenting uh, my research and also talk about uh, broader ideas in the field in general. Uh, so it's very exciting. Um, so uh, today's lecture slash talk is mostly going to be about the things that kind of inspired me and my work. Um, I am going to talk about one of my research papers, but it's it's mostly about the context and the history that kind of led up to that paper. And hopefully, like the insights from uh, what I've learned is maybe useful for your research or maybe the, the course that you're taking currently. Um, so, so far, you've learned a lot about perception for robotics. Um, so you learned about things like object detection where the objective is given an image, you draw a bounding box saying that's a box and that's a cat or a dog. Um, and uh, Prof Yuxiang also probably told you about object pose estimation, um, which is again, uh, we're figuring out the six stop pose of objects in, in like a RGB image. Um, so these are well-established problems from computer vision. And if you go to a place like CVPR, uh, which is the biggest conference in computer vision, you will see like a thousand papers that do you know, object detection and pose estimation. Uh, but since we are in robotics, I think we can be slightly rebellious and we can ask if this problem formulation really makes sense. Um, so one of my favorite things to do is always annoy people by asking them uh, what are objects and uh, uh, people usually struggle to define what exactly is an object. Um, so in this video, uh, a person is making hand-pulled doodles um, and think about how you would use a framework like object detection or segmentation or pose estimation for any of this, right? Uh, what's the pose of every single noodle? What's the pose of the water? Um, would you use segmentation masks to represent these strands of noodles? How about these particles at the bottom, right? Um, if you're doing something like this, where you're mixing water, right? Uh, where does it start? Like, where do, where's the boundary of every single particle of flour. Um, so this is something that is kind of very obvious if you work in robotics. Uh, a lot of the things that we kind of assume is kind of given to us in vision, like the concept of objects, um, is really hard to sort of get to work in, in the robotics space. Um, so there's something weird about objects, and I'm not just handpicking this example uh, to make a point here. Um, and I want you to sort of pay attention to uh, what you're doing when you're eating your food, right? Like how would you use any of these frameworks uh, when you're eating food? Uh, it turns out it's extremely difficult. Um, so the reason for, for this kind of um, mismatch is maybe we've been sort of overfitting to one perspective of computer vision. Um, so David Morris is, is a very influential person in the field of computer vision. And his idea of perception was uh, it's a very computational process which converts an image, a uh, retinal image, into a representation of 3D shapes, right? And this is kind of the basic thing that we've, we've been seeing in most of computer vision, like object detection or pose estimation. Um, but are there any other perspectives? Obviously, because you know it doesn't work with everything in the real world. Like, how would you represent noodles with um, object detection or pose estimation? Um, and for that, I would recommend taking a look at uh, Professor uh, uh, Lana Lesnick's course at UIUC. Um, she has this amazing course called, uh, you know, looking back and forward in computer vision. Um, and it gives you a very nice summary of um, the historical perspectives on computer vision, uh, which doesn't just, you know, talk about this kind of Marian view of we're going to process an image. Um, so this is a slide kind of directly stolen from her lectures. Um, you can obviously check out her lectures for more info. Uh, but to briefly summarize, there are kind of two more perspectives that were kind of left out uh, from history. Um, so there was this person called James Gibson, um, who actually went in the complete opposite direction 
Um, and he said, no, vision is not about computation. Um, there is no retinal image. There are no representations. Uh, there is no 3D shape. And the only thing that matters is uh, are ecological variance and invariance. Um, now, what does that mean, right? It sounds it sounds uh, uh, something. It sounds like it's something very different. Um, but what he was saying was, when you have a complicated scene like this, where you have like this, you know, elaborate uh, piece of dough, um, instead of trying to represent this with um, in a segmentation mask or a pose, uh, what you only care about is basically how you interact with that object. Um, so, can you stretch it? Um, can I tear it? Um, and the main difference here is there's some component of actions, right? So it's not just about what is in the image, it's about how can you actually act on the things in the scene. Um, so uh, can you break it? Can you eat it? And these are the things that are kind of very common in the natural world. Um, so if you look at most animals, they don't have a perception system for the sake of doing perception, right? Um, we either need to detect predators to run away from them. Uh, we need to detect fruits so that we can eat them. Um, so there's always some component of action that's kind of missing from all these um, existing sort of computer vision frameworks. Um, and this is where Gibson coined the term uh, affordances. Um, and affordance is basically telling you sort of what can you do with this object. Um, and his idea is kind of you're going to drive most of perception uh, by reasoning about actions um, rather than just you know passively processing an image. Um, and then later on, there was also other folks who kind of refined this perspective, like Jan Kondrick, um, who said, it's not just about actions and perception, uh, but the entire perception experience is kind of very subjective um, to an observer, right? And it's not even specific to sort of one embodiment. Um, so go back to this example, imagine if you're an ant, right? And you're not even a human. Um, and the, this ant is kind of experiencing this whole kitchen from a very different perspective. Um, so for this ant, um, this piece of dough is not even an object, right? It's just something that you walk on, um, like the way we walk on the ground, we don't think about the ground as an object. Um, and similarly, this ant has extremely different goals in its mind. Um, it's very hard to explain to an ant why the human is spending eight hours, you know, making handful noodles, uh, when you can just pick up a sugar cube and be done with your food for the day, right? Um, so the concept of like what we want to do is also very specific to our embodiments. Um, and usually most of perception is kind of goal directed. Um, you, you can notice that there's an infinite amount of detail at which you can represent the world, uh, but we usually don't do this. We usually focus on the things that's kind of relevant to us. Um, and this is precisely why you know humans and other animals have you know perceptive blind spots. Um, so we can't see everything at, um, you know in one go. Um, so there are these kind of three perspectives. Uh, just to briefly summarize, you know, the traditional view is kind of perception is an image processing uh, system, right? I'm, I have an image and I'm going to process that image. Um, and the Gibsonian view is sort of like, um, it's not just an image, but also it's somehow directed by actions. And you have to think about how you can sort of manipulate things or, you know, interact with things in your environment. And it's not just about processing the image. Um, and finally, um, it's also not just directed by actions, but also it's specific to goals and uh, embodiments, right? So uh, in robotics, we don't have just a single type of embodiment. Uh, we do have humanoid robots that look like humans with two hands and two legs. Um, but there are lots of things like drones, self-driving cars, underwater vehicles, which look almost nothing like humans. And they live in environments which most humans probably won't visit. Uh, but they're also robots, right? Um, so you have to think about uh, perception in the context of embodiments and environments as well. Um, cool. Any any questions on sort of uh, this kind of high level overview so far? Uh, does anybody understand like the high level um, sort of perspectives from this kind of three areas? Okay, cool. It's pretty simple. I mean, you don't have to. Uh, it, it's not it's not very sort of technically heavy or anything. So it's a very simple concept. Um, so since you guys have been mostly looking at sort of the image processing side of things in this course, um, I thought maybe this lecture we sort of dive deep dive into sort of these other two aspects, which are uh, kind of action directed and um, and goal um, directed uh, uh, perception. Um, so we're going to study this with a uh, with a case study, and this is a paper that we kind of uh, put out last year called Perceiver Actor. 
Um, uh, I'll present a lot of details about this paper, but you can always, you know, Google this and there's a lot of resources on implementing this and there's a full paper on trying to understand this. Uh, but I just want to use this as a case study to talk about the concepts that I presented. Um, and um, I'm going to be sort of, uh, so one of the reasons I spent 10 minutes motivating this uh, before I talk about the paper um, is that this is kind of a modern paper that uses, you know, the latest techniques like transformers, but it's actually based on some really old ideas. Um, and in the coming few slides, I'm going to be talking about how do you connect these like super old ideas and perception um, with modern tools like uh, transformers uh, from machine learning. Um, so uh, first, I'm going to present sort of a broad overview of what Perceiver Actor is. Um, then I'm going to talk about some results, and then I'll show you how exactly it works and how you could potentially implement it yourself. Um, so Perceiver Actor is, uh, uh, is something uh, called a multitask six-stop manipulation agent. Uh, the multitask part means that it can not only do one thing, but it can do a, a lot of things, right? Um, so uh, a model like GPT is kind of a generalist. It not only knows how to summarize things, but it can write things. Um, so it's not specific to one task. It can do a lot of things. Um, uh, and it's a manipulation agent uh, means it can sort of interact with its environment by using its arm to uh, move objects, push objects, uh, and do whatever. Um, so this is an example of it picking up the tomato and putting it in a bin. Um, so this is the language command that was given to the robot. Um, and the setting in which this system is trained is uh, called imitation learning. And imitation learning is when a human sort of demonstrates what the task uh, is. And the idea is to sort of copy that task and sort of generalize better. Um, this is the same setting as in like all these language models are trained, right? So a language model is trained on a trajectory of human, human words and sentences. Um, you can think of this as a similar thing where you're training on human demonstrated actions for the robot. Um, so it's a very similar setting where you're just trying to copy whatever the human does, uh, but in a more kind of robust way. Uh, and hopefully you kind of generalize to newer tasks. Um, and one thing I like to do when I uh, try to uh, understand a system is like, you know, think about what is the input and the output. Um, the input to the system here is uh, a dense RGBD voxel grid. Um, and a voxels basically are the 3D representation of pixels. Uh, so you know an image is a, a grid of 2D pixels. Uh, we just have a 3D version of this, which is um, a voxel grid. Um, so for every uh, voxel, there's a location and then like an RGB value. Um, the input is also a language goal, uh, which kind of specifies what you want to achieve. Um, and this is where the whole idea of sort of goal specification comes in. Um, so we are not just you know, detecting all the objects in the scene, uh, but we're kind of specifically looking at things which are relevant to the certain goal. Um, so if you say tomatoes, you only want to say maybe look at tomatoes and not the entire scene. Um, the output space is uh, without having any sort of other intermediate representation, um, you directly go from this voxel grid and language goal um, to a discretized action that kind of tells you what to do next. Um, so if you're picking up this tomato, uh, you can see this is kind of the output of the system, uh, which is kind of telling you a six-stop pose uh, for the gripper to go to. Um, and this is the first action. And once it gets there, you can sort of run the framework again, and it will give you the next action until you sort of solve the task. Um, so the important thing to notice here is that um, there are a couple of tricks which kind of make it um, super uh, 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 kind of uh, super efficient because of all the same reasons that I talked about. Um, uh, so if you remember the affordance framework, which kind of said, you know, it's not about detecting the objects, uh, but it's about sort of figuring out how do you manipulate that object, right? Um, so we are not trying to, you know, draw a boundary around this tomato saying, you know, that's the tomato. Uh, but what we try to learn is how do you manipulate that tomato, right? So you try to predict the action or the affordance of what you would do with that tomato. And you say that is the kind of the perception system. Um, and it's, it's, if you want to think about it as an object detector, um, the objective is almost the same, except instead of detecting objects, you detect actions. Um, and the other thing to notice here is also that kind of the observation space and the action space are almost uh, aligned in the sense that every one of these voxels is a potential observation that you can get from the environment, uh, but you could also go to that location um, as an action, right? 
Um, so when you predict actions, you're actually predicting actions in the same observation space, which is this kind of 3D voxel grid. Um, but uh, let me just pause here to make sure that everybody understands this whole concept of sort of detecting actions. Uh, it's, it's a very similar framework to sort of detecting objects. The only thing is the objective is different. Does anybody have any questions about that? There are two tomatoes, but it is picking out uh, both the tomatoes from the stem instead of picking out one tomato. That's right. So all of this is, uh, that's a good question. Um, so all of this is kind of learned from human demonstrations. Um, so in the human demonstrations, if the task was only to pick the tomatoes, and if the human user always picked it by the stems and it always picked, it didn't care about how many tomatoes, it's probably going to do that. Um, so in the demonstrations, if the, the human picked it by the, by the fruit, um, then it would part of, kind of probably do that as well. There's one more. Yeah. Uh, so because Clear Actor uh, is focused on learning the action rather than representations, um, can this be extended to objects that don't have, let's say, uh, like a consistent shape or form, like that noodle example that we were talking about earlier? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so that, I was going to show you some examples, uh, but yeah, that's exactly um, where it kind of shines. Actually, well, I can just show you results here. Um, so you can have um, deformable objects like um, like a piece of rope. Um, um, yeah, so this is it manipulating the rope. Um, and all it's doing is just kind of predicting actions rather than trying to estimate the state of this uh, thing. It's not as complicated as uh, holding a noodle because it, the action space is just like, you know, a 2D gripper. Uh, but also you can like, um, you know, you can sweep things like beans, which are, um, let me see if I can play this. Um, so it's kind of hard to represent the state of this beans, right? But the only thing that you care about is, you know, where to, you know, uh, what the affordance of the start pushing and what the affordance of the end pushing is. It's just a purely reactive system that does that. And you don't need to sort of try to you know, detect all the beans or estimate the pose of any of these beans. Uh, but yeah, I'll talk about more results um, um, later. Um, cool. Uh, shall I go forward? Is there any other questions? OK, cool. Um, so I'm going to show you some results from Perceiver Actor, and then I'm going to go into sort of the history, and then I'll, I'll present you some uh, exactly how it works. Um, so all the results I'm about to show you are from one multitask agent um, that was trained from scratch uh, only with the real world data uh, with a total of 53 demonstrations. And these 53 demonstrations were collected by me. I'll show you the data collection interface later on, but it's it's it just takes about like, you know, an hour uh, hour and a half to collect all these demonstrations. Um, so this first task is a very high precision task, which involves uh, pressing this hand sanitizer. Um, and then there's sort of a tolerance of one centimeter where you have to press it exactly uh, at the tip over there. Um, you can perturb the scene and it still gets it right. Um, here's the same agent um, where you ask it to, you just change the scene and ask it to do something else, like uh, put the lime in the bottom bin, the tomatoes in the top bin, or the blue whiteboard marker in the mug. Um, this is a slightly longer task where you have to open the drawer and put the tape inside. You can perturb the scene and it still gets sort of the handle right. Uh, this object kind of slips out of reach. Uh, I had to reset the scene so that it can reach it. It gets it out on the second try. Uh, you can also use things like tools, right? So it doesn't really have a detector for uh, wooden sticks, uh, but you can still use a wooden stick to hit a ball um, or this kind of sweeping example. Uh, this is slightly hard because you have one arm to sweep this, um, and it's even when I tried it, it's kind of hard to sweep with one hand. Uh, usually, we have two hands where we hold the dustpan on the other hand and then we sweep. Uh, but it might be possible to do it with two arms and then one. Um, so how does it work? Um, so it's based on a lot of insights from two different communities. Uh, one is kind of the affordance learning community that's been so popular in robotics. 
Um, the other is also kind of the transformers community, which has been um, uh, so good at scaling up things with uh, data. Um, and I'm going to go into some history of both of these communities because I think the insights from these communities actually kind of led up to um, all the kind of contributions of this paper. Um, so the transformer paper came out in 2017. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure most of you probably know about this. This is kind of the driving force behind all the language models, chat GPT, everything. Um, and the next year, the same group of people, the people who did the transformers, they tried to take the NLP model and they tried to get it to work on uh, images. Um, so what they did was they, condition, they, they formulated image generation as a pixel-wise generation task. So given a sequence of pixels, the objective is to predict the next sequence of pixels, um, just like how you would predict word tokens. Uh, but unfortunately, this never scaled. Um, so you can see like this result from 2018 is quite blurry. They don't look like anything that these diffusion models or all the latest and best you know, image generation methods can do. And the problem for that is um, you know, a pixel has a lot less information than a single word. Um, so when you're generating words, you're already using a space which is very high level, right? So a word has a lot more high level information um, than a single pixel. Um, so there's not a lot of information for you to sort of predict what exactly is happening in the sequence. Um, and unfortunately, it never scaled. So if you look at all the latest image generation modules, like none of them are trying to generate at a pixel level because it's very hard to scale them. Um, then the next year, um, there was a community which kind of took a step backward. Um, instead of trying to predict pixels, uh, one pixel at a time, uh, they went back to object detection. So they, what they would do is they would do object detection on objects, and then they would feed in the features for every one of these um, objects inside an image. Uh, but again, the problem here is object detection, as I said, right? In robotics, um, if you want to do object detection, how would you use it on noodles or how would you use it on flower particles or anything like that? And finally, um, after nearly three years of the original transformer paper came out, um, they somehow figured out the right problem formulation to use transformers for vision. Um, this was kind of the, the, the now famous vision transformer paper or VIT. Um, and the solution was very simple. It's instead of feeding in pixels, right, which kind of give you very little information, you break it down into patches. So you take an image and then you just chop it up into small patches. And then you try to feed the sequence of patches rather than sequence of pixels. Um, and the reason why this works is a, a patch has a, a lot more information than a single pixel. Um, so you can learn um, you know, more high level things rather than trying to figure out all the low level details. Um, so this is kind of a very nice, like you can call it an inductive bias, uh, which kind of is everywhere in computer vision, which tells you that you know, looking at local regions, not just a single pixel, um, it can help you sort of learn broader things about the entire image. Um, and uh, this is a very useful insight and it's gonna be used in Perceiver after as well, uh, except instead of doing 2D, we'll just do 3D. Um, the other community, which has also been um, kind of going, uh, uh, you know, other communities are doing a lot of progress in terms of robotics, um, has been sort of taking this Gibsonian idea of affordances. Uh, remember I was talking about, you know, it's not about the object, but the action you would take to uh, manipulate that object. Um, so Ian Lenz et al. kind of had this really pioneering work in 2014, um, which was basically the first thing to sort of predict grasps. Um, so what you would get is you would get like an RGBD image off the scene. Um, and the objective was to simply predict this kind of um, grasp location, right? So like an X, Y, and theta, which tells you where you want to grasp the object. Um, it's a very simple objective. Like you can pretty much use the same perception system we have for object detection. Um, so if you look at these architectures that they used, it's almost identical to object detection. But instead of drawing like a, a mask around this uh, drill over here um, or the remote control, what you would do is you would basically draw the action that you would take, which is how you would grasp it. Um, and then this kind of was so popular and um, it got so good that it's actually used in a lot of industrial applications. Um, so if you go to like a lot of these pick and play startups like, uh, you know, Covariant, um, uh, and uh, uh, NIMBY Robotics, um, they're all kind of doing some variations of these kind of visual affordance prediction. And the basic idea is the same, where you have an RGBD image, um, you run it through a convolutional network, um, and the output is basically pixel-wise uh, heat maps, which tell you 
how successful will you be if you sort of pick that object at that location? Um, and uh, there were some kind of pioneering works by Andy Jang, Churan Song, and, and a bunch of folks um, who kind of won the Amazon picking challenge with these uh, approaches, um, and then was kind of later adopted by the industry. Um, and again, it's kind of uh, a system which kind of takes actions to drive the perception system. Um, so this is a very different way that we, you know, traditionally approach robotics, where we say, you know, first the computer vision people will figure out vision, and then we will do uh, how do you take actions. But this is kind of the opposite direction, where you say the actions themselves um, drive the perception system. Um, and um, in 2019, uh, Andy Jeng et al. kind of extended this uh, to this really cool tossing bot um, setup, which is a really cool paper that you should probably read. It's called Tossing Bot. Um, so it not only predicts grasps or where you want to grasp it, it, it predicts one more parameter, uh, which is the target velocity at which you want to throw the object. Um, so it's just literally exactly the same thing, except one more parameter which says, you know, I want to release it at this velocity. Um, and then it kind of does some magical things. Uh, and the coolest part of this paper, if you, if you look at the appendix, um, is when you pick an object like this whiteboard marker, and you try to look at the features of this whiteboard marker, it automatically highlights every other whiteboard marker in the scene. And this is not like a traditional perception system that looks at this whiteboard marker and says it's a cylinder, it's a certain color, that's why it's the same as this other whiteboard marker. Um, this one is telling you that if you throw all these objects, they will all have very similar properties when you're throwing them. So it's kind of a perception system that's very grounded in some physical parameters rather than some uh, abstract things like you know color, shape, geometry. Uh, it's but more about kind of like if I flick it, what will happen? Um, and uh, that it was kind of super cool. Um, but the real problem with all these kind of interfaces is that they're still kind of missing the third aspect of what I presented on the three perspectives. Um, they were missing the whole goal conditioning part where you know, they could pick some object and so some object, uh, but if you wanted to specifically pick this ping pong ball, uh, you would have to, you know, retrain the system or you would have to give it like an image of the ping pong ball or something like that. Um, so uh, all of this is uh, really cool. It directly reasons about actions, but it's missing that, you know, goal conditioning uh, component. Um, this is where I came in. And then um, I had this paper uh, in 2021 where I condition these affordance models on language. Uh, so it's a very simple extension. Um, it's just that when you're uh, predicting the affordance or like what, what the action you have to take, um, you just give it a goal, right? And this goal is kind of supervised during uh, training using a lot of data. Um, and the hope is that you're kind of predicting goal-directed affordances. Um, and uh, I think this paper is on the reading list for this class much later when you talk about pre-training. So, I won't go into the much uh, details about this, but uh, yeah, you'll, you'll probably learn about this later in the class. Um, the problem with all of this is kind of uh, notice that everything is stuck to a tabletop and then you know everything is kind of top down. Um, so it's predicting like these very cool pick and place actions, but everything is stuck into this you know 2D tabletop plane where you're just doing this all the time. Um, and to solve this, the community kind of had um, uh, another solution, uh, which uh, was kind of developed in parallel with all these works. Um, so one natural solution, if you want to go from 2D to 3D, uh, is to use sort of a 3D uh, action and observation space. Um, so this is when voxel grids came about, where uh, you take sort of some uh, camera images from multiple angles, you do some sort of 3D reconstruction of the scene, um, and then you use this 3D green construction as input and also as output. Um, uh, and this is exactly what I was showing you at the start of uh, Perceiver Actor. And that's why we use like a 3D voxel grid so we can do uh, 3D actions. Uh, but there's one big problem with using uh, you know, 3D voxel grid. Uh, it's very high dimensional in nature. Um, so you can imagine everything kind of grows at a cubic rate. Um, so if you want to have uh, a simple system which has you know 100 uh, voxels in one dimension, it will become like 100 cubed. So it's like a million voxels just for some simple scene. Um, so it's always hard to kind of deal with the dimensionality of these uh, things. Um, so there was this kind of two things happening in parallel. Uh, a lot of people were working on transformers and they were figuring out better and better problem formulations um, on how to use these amazing um, sort of data high capacity models uh, for their domains. 
Um, and on the other side, we've had a lot of uh, uh, sort of progress in affordance learning for robotics. Um, so the question for the community, uh, from the community on the transformer side was what's the right sort of tokenization, right? Uh, so we saw that with NLP, uh, you can tokenize uh, uh, sort of words or sub tokens, sub words. Uh, with vision, we can sort of look at patches. Uh, so what's the right problem formulation for robotics? Um, since robotics is obviously more than kind of a 2D problem, uh, you know, if you're doing six stop manipulation, the answer is in the name, right? Six stop means it's more than just uh, 2D. Um, so maybe we should just encode 3D voxel patches. It's, it's, it's a relatively obvious uh, step up from 2D patches. Um, and the reason for, uh, you know, I, I kind of advocate for more 3D uh, is uh, if you look at a lot of these kind of end-to-end -end behavior cloning approaches, um, there's a number of problems that come up with when you have a, a static monocular camera. Uh, so most systems that do end-to-end, -end, you know, robot learning, uh, they have an RGB images input and they are directly predicting actions in some sort of high dimensional space. Um, so if you do this, you have to learn hand-eye coordination in the sense that you have to understand what it means to be in like, you know, front, you know, further away. Um, so you need to learn that sort of transformation between your hand and your eye. Uh, but in our system, if you kind of, you know, detect actions, um, you assume there's a calibration between every single location in the observation and where you could, your hand can get to, right? So this kind of calibration is kind of given to you rather than having to learn that from, from data. Um, the other thing is also depth cues. Um, so this is something that's super hard to tell in this image. Like, is this um, hanger almost there or is it like, you know, a really big hanger that needs a lot more, you know, uh, time to reach that uh, uh, handle over there. Uh, so it's kind of not intuitive to sort of estimate how far away things are by just looking at RGB images. Um, and also camera perturbations. Uh, if you take this scene and then you slightly change the camera angle, uh, most of these kind of end-to-end -end learning methods will kind of completely freak out. Um, and this is something so intuitive to humans, right? So when we look at the world, if we just turn our head, it's not a completely new world. It's just a different perspective of the, the same world. Uh, but for most kind of end-to-end -end systems, you know, this is a new world and this is the new world. And you know, learning that kind of correspondence itself is is like sort of a, a big problem for them. Um, but if you have this kind of 3D thing, which is already sort of in the same workspace as the robot, um, you can be sort of more robust to perturbations. Uh, in fact, in a lot of our experiments, like my camera got bumped during train and test time, uh, but all I have to do is just recalibrate the, the hand eye and then it should, it should still work even if I sort of bump the camera. Um, also distractors, uh, sometimes it's hard to say what is part of the texture and what is part of the scene. Um, and then one big important thing is also data augmentation, right? Um, so I don't know if you've uh, talked about self-supervised learning in this class, but um, Self-supervised learning is like a big thing in computer vision uh, right now. And the main idea behind that is you define augmentation functions that kind of keep the data, but like perturb the input. Um, so if you take a crop of an image or you rotate and translate it, it should still have a picture of a dog. So you can say like, you can have an objective that says, you know, even after translation and rotation, the dog is still a dog. So learn some sort of unique representation of that, right? Um, so you can do all of that in 2D, but it's hard to do that in 3D. Uh, but if you explicitly have a 3D representation, uh, you can just use the same objective functions like you know, random translations, crop and um, masking and all these amazing things from computer vision, except you can just do that in 3D um, and then you will have much more robust representations. Um, so, uh, the other question from the other community, uh, if you remember the last point was, um, if you have voxel grids, they are very high dimensional um, uh, inputs, you know, how do you deal with that, right? Um, and uh, I'm gonna present this thing called the latent space transformer, uh, which basically allows you to scale up to extremely large context lengths. Um, cool, so those are kind of the two insights from these two communities. Um, these are kind of relatively obvious uh, insights. Like if you kind of kept track of these papers, uh, you know, going from 2D to 3D is not, you know, an amazing, amazingly hard uh, uh, insight. Um, and also, uh, I'll talk about this uh, in a bit. Um, cool. Um, now I can actually talk about um, the paper. <laughs> uh, but this is, I hope this kind of motivation up to like how the history and like the context of all these other works kind of influenced this. 
Um, I think if, if I, when I explain the architecture, I think it should be relatively obvious to like all the questions about why I specifically made these design choices um, uh, because it, they're kind of basically just stolen insights from, uh, from these other papers. Um, cool, so perceiver actor, um, uh, what it gets is, is a voxel a grid of the scene. Um, so if you're opening a drawer, uh, you have multiple cameras around the scene, uh, which kind of has a, a, a kind of an RGBD view from different viewpoints. Uh, you do some standard 3D reconstruction, so you get a 3D grid of the scene. Um, and the first thing you do is you take um, the language, which is given by the user. Um, you encode it with some language encoder. So for every token, you have some sort of embedding. Um, then you take this voxel grid, and then you break it down into patches. Um, so if you remember from VITs, VITs broke down images into 2D patches. Um, in Perceiver Actor, we do exactly the same thing, except we do it with 3D voxel patches. Um, so if this uh, input is a hundred by hundred by hundred, uh, and it's like you know a million voxels, um, you can break it down into five by five by five patches. Um, so you you eventually sort of um, tokenize the input into a series of these uh, patched voxels. Um, and the output of the system is kind of, uh, you're learning some sort of feature for every single voxel in the scene by encoding it with a giant transformer. Um, and this transformer is essentially the same as vision transformers or everything else that are uh, kind of popular in vision. Um, but the main difference, as I said, is when you're dealing with voxels, um, everything is super high dimensional. Um, so if this grid is you know, 100 voxels by 100, 100 um, even after extracting you know, five cube patches, uh, you still have 8,000 things as input, right? Um, 8,000 units of input is still extremely long for something like a transformer. Uh, most systems kind of struggle um, beyond like 1,000 or 2,000, uh, simply because uh, transformers are not designed for extremely long input sequences. Um, and it's the same problem for anything, actually. So if you look at RNNs as well, right, they have issues with catastrophic for forgetting. Um, so if your sequence is extremely long, um, your history has to keep track of everything from the past. Um, and here, it, the history is kind of basically the sequence of everything in this entire giant grid. Um, so to deal with this kind of high dimensional thing, we use this uh, trick called Perceiver IO. This is a paper from DeepMind. Um, and this is kind of a trick that was kind of popping up in a lot of different places. Um, so if you look at papers like uh, latent diffusion, uh, sorry, it's, it's another variant of stable diffusion. Um, if you look at, um, you know, a lot of these things, they kind of use the exact same trick uh, for basically dealing with extremely large um, input spaces. Um, so in latent diffusion, they were trying to come up with an extremely large image of uh, whatever they're trying to generate. Uh, but obviously, this kind of doesn't scale so well. Um, and that's why they were kind of using similar tricks. Um, and the trick is, uh, is also very simple. Uh, so if your input is very high dimensional, what you do is you go from this high dimensional input into a much, much smaller latent space, right? Um, and uh, this latent space trick is like everywhere from like VAE, VAEs and, and whatnot. Um, and these latent vectors are kind of just randomly initialized vectors uh, of size, you know, 2048 by 512. So there's 2048 vectors of 512 uh, dimensions, and they're just randomly initialized. Um, and what you do is uh, you use cross attention and cross attention is the same attention mechanism in transformers. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys have learned about attention mechanisms in this class, but um, uh, that's something to might be uh, good to brush up on if you're unfamiliar with this. Uh, uh, but you probably have heard of things like the query keys and values. Um, if, I, if, you're, if you haven't, you can always look it up later. Uh, it's, it's very easy to summarize what they are um, in like a, a simple snippet. Um, but the basic concept is when you're doing attention, your keys and values come from your input and your queries come from these latent uh, uh, vectors. Um, so you've es essentially compressed this very high dimensional input into this very low dimensional latent space. Um, and then when you can run your transformer, you run your transformer on this much smaller latent space. Um, so you don't have to deal with the very high dimensional input. And then where, when you're generating the output, you kind of do the opposite um, so that you can get back the same high dimensional output, uh, but your keys and values come from the latent, but the, you know, the queries come from the input. 
Um, and that's kind of the trick to basically deal with extremely large um, uh, sort of input and op uh, output action spaces. Um, so once you run it through your transformer, um, you get this kind of magical feature vector that kind of has a, a feature for every single voxel in your scene. Um, so you remember from uh, your convolutional networks, your output was something like a small 2D grid with extremely deep channels. Um, so this is exactly the same, except it's in 3D, right? Um, so your output is 100 queued by some n-dimensional feature vector, which is you know 64 dimensions. Um, so you can use this to predict translations. Um, so when you're predicting where to go next, um, all you do is you simply pick one of the voxels in the scene, right? And you can treat this as a very simple classification problem. Um, so you can imagine this is a one and everything else is a zero because the expert action was exactly like this. And you can think of this as training a classifier, right? It's literally the same as training a classifier to say, I wanna pick this action. And when you're doing things like rotations, uh, you can max pool this entire uh, feature. Um, so you just have you know, 64 features and then you can predict, predict uh, discretized Euler angles, like you know, uh, five degree increments for X, Y, and Z. And for open and close of the gripper, again, you predict like a discretized action. Um, so this entire problem just becomes the very simple uh, classification task where you look at what the expert did and you just basically try to train a classifier to predict that action at that time step. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, I know it feels like a lot of details, but um, it's relatively easy to implement. So if you go to this website, if you Google Perceiver Actor, um, you can train this on a Colab notebook and everything, um, and the code and everything is sort of uh, public, um, but I'll probably just pause here and take some questions if you um, guys have any uh, sort of burning questions about how it works or anything. So um, I have one. Can you can you uh, again tell me what is Q trans? Okay. So um, the output of this entire transformer is this kind of dense feature grid, right? Um, it's just like this hundred cube by sixty four feature. Uh, I think uh, you understand uh, up until this part, right? This is fine. Um, the output. So you want to predict like a translation location to go to, right? So basically, where you want to go next in the uh, in the this this action space. Um, so Qtrans is basically a function which transforms um, this feature vector into a single location that, to go to, right? So if you have um, uh, you know a hundred. Um, 100 by one. So what happens is you transform this dense feature vector into uh, a single uh, sort of 100 cube uh, value of things which you can potentially go to, right? And it basically tells you what is the location to go to next. Got it. Does that make sense? X, Y, Z. Yeah, it's basically X, Y, Z. Any questions for Mohit at this point? I have a quick question. So when you like deal with rotation, you're max pooling on the spatial dimension and then putting that into an LLP. Is that is there a specific reason why you max pool before you get those um rotational and open collide actions? Yeah, um that's a good question. Actually, there's something uh very weird about the way that rotation works here. Um, uh, but uh, the way, the reason why you do max pool is basically when you do max pool, you get the feature of this, uh, the, the feature that kind of was used to predict the translation value. So you might get the feature of this exact same voxel over here when you do the max pool. And then you can basically take that feature and then ask it to predict so discretized um, rotation uh, for each axis. Um, but that's kind of the intuition behind the max pool. Um, so you basically want to get the feature that was kind of picked for um, this translation over here. And and by uh, so here it is kind of independent to some extent, like you have translation followed by rotation. Yes. Uh, but when you are actually executing this action, how is how is that handled? Like, is it like is the act is the goal for the action x, y, z, r, p, y, or is it like go to this x, y, z and then followed by r, p, y? 
Yeah, um, so it is related in the sense that both the translation and the rotation, they come from this feature vector. So you can think of these as two different heads, right? Uh, but the base is still the same in the sense that there's some sort of connection between the translation rotation. Uh, but the actual execution, what you do is you convert this into a six stop pose, right? So this gives you X, Y, Z, and this gives you your option role. And you convert that into a six stop pose basically. And the output to the, the system is basically a fixed off pose to go to. So it will give you like a, a position, you know, X, Y, Z, your option role, which you could give to a motion planner to reach that pose. Um, so the, the translation and rotation is combined into one, one action uh, when you're executing. Yeah. Um, but this, this whole thing is just basically trying to discretize everything into sort of a simple classification problem. Um, so you, you in, in all the examples I presented, right? Um, so in the, this kind of like pick and place things, um, all you're doing is kind of predicting like an X, Y location to pick the object, right? And it's kind of way of discretizing the action space where like every pixel is also like an action and you're basically learning an action value for every one of those pixels. And it's essentially the same idea except in, in 3D. Yeah, so uh, does this model uh, predict the next best pose in kind of a closed loop fashion or does it uh, predict the entire sequence of poses that it has to take to execute the entire action? Yeah, that's a good question. It actually predicts just uh, one action at a time. And I'm, uh, I'll show you an example and maybe it's easier. So what it does is at every time step, it predicts one action, it executes and it gets a new observation and then it executes again. And it keeps do you're doing this in a loop. Um, but this whole system is just like a one step purely reactive system. It doesn't really think about future actions. Um, so this is an example uh, where uh, you have to pick up this wooden stick and hit the ball. And uh, this is kind of a series of predictions from the model. Uh, so the first prediction is kind of the uh, go above the stick. So it does that and it gets a new observation. Um, then it goes down and actually grasps the stick. Um, then now it wants to go on the other side. And then finally it hits the ball. Um, so these green things are the gripper predictions from, from the network. Does that make sense? And the reason behind this is like, because the demonstration was given in this particular fashion, is that? Yeah, that's right. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I'll talk about the way the data was collected. Uh, that's probably as a nice segue to like, um, why I'm sort of predicting those kind of actions in that sense. Um, so, uh, so the data, the way it works is I, I basically collect a few demonstrations with this interface that I have, and I'll show you how the interface looks like. Um, but um, let's say you collect a trajectory like this, right? So you go down here and then you pick up the block. Um, you could potentially try to predict every single step of this uh, trajectory. So a standard behavior cloning system, what they would do is they would try to predict every one of these orange points um, given the current observations. Uh, but this is kind of very inefficient. You can see that um, you can potentially take multiple paths to reach these sort of intermediate points, right? So there's only sort of two important key points here that are actually relevant. Um, so this is first is kind of this pre grass pose, and then the next one is kind of the grass pose. Uh, but it doesn't matter what path you take to reach those key points, right? So as long as you can sort of figure out how to get there, um, it, it doesn't matter. Um, so what we do is we use this uh, heuristic by uh, this prior work from James et al, uh, where we extract a bunch of keyframes, which kind of tell you what are the poses to go to. Um, and these keyframes kind of will fall out out of the interface I'll show you next, uh, but they use a very simple heuristic. Um, the heuristic is whenever the join velocities are zero. Uh, so th these joints, they can tell you sort of what is the velocity at which they're rotating. Uh, when they're zero and the gripper open state has not changed, this is like a very simple heuristic, it's recorded as a key point. Um, now, once you have these key points, what you can do is you can turn every single data point in this trajectory into predict the next best keyframe action classification task. Um, so you, if you have an observation of the robot, which is like over here, um, you can just say, I wanna predict the action that's over here. Uh, and it's the same for this, you predict the action over here, but once you reach this key point, um, you can go on to the next keyframe action. And in some sense, you, this is sort of a way of augmenting the data. Um, even though this is one trajectory in the data set, you can potentially get hundreds of sort of intermediate data points to train your model on. 
because every single point in this trajectory is potentially a data point for you to train your, your model. Um, does everybody understand this kind of uh, system of sort of training based on kind of intermediate steps uh, to predict the next keyframe action? Uh, one question. Yes. So will this robot ever be able to smoothly perform an action without stopping? Or does it need to Yeah. Be yeah, that's a good question. So one of the things that you lose from this kind of procedure is sort of how do you deal with continuous actions? Um, so if you're sort of um, trying to pour something, right, which is not just about here, here, but it's actually getting that trajectory to nicely pour the water, um, it would struggle with that. Um, but there might be some ways of sort of trying to learn this kind of intermediate sort of trajectory as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's uh, definitely some sort of the limitation of using this kind of keyframe approach. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show you the data set setup. I think uh, this is what I used to collect the demonstrations. It's probably easier to understand what the keyframes means in the context of this real world setup. Um, so I have a VR controller. And um, this VR controller uh, kind of gives me sort of poses of the controller itself. Um, and then when I move the controller, I have like a visualizer, which kind of tells me where I could potentially, I could uh, go to, right? And every time I click a button, um, it basically goes to that pose. Um, so uh, when I'm recording keyframes, that's the second keyframe, um, third keyframe, fourth keyframe. Uh, let me just do that again. So it's, uh, maybe I went too fast. Um, so basically every time I click, um, I use a motion planner to reach that six stop pose. And every one of my clicks is basically recorded as a keyframe action. Um, so there's another one and there's another one. Um, yeah. Actually, Karthik has used this interface uh, to collect his own data set. Um, so he can probably tell you more about how terrible it is. <laughs> um, Cool, yeah, so this is what the data set looks like. And this is the size of the data set that I collected. Um, uh, so you can see that it's for all these tasks, you just need about you know 10 minutes of data. Um, this is one of the trade-offs that you get. Um, so this is less applicable to continuous tasks like uh, the person just mentioned, uh, but you can get this sort of extremely data efficient way of sort of training these giant models. Um, so even with just sort of five demonstrations, you can get pretty robust policies for the press hand sanitizer task um, and all these um, setups. Um, cool, yeah. So um, I've also have some visualizations on what the predictions of these models look like. Um, so if you remember the hand sanitizer uh, task where you have to press this button, um, it sort of just predicts uh, a gripper location to go to before you press the button closes the fingers and then it presses down. Um, so it's it's you notice that the 3D representation of this hand sanitizer is pretty bad because it's a transparent objects and most depth cameras kind of struggle with it. Uh, but it doesn't really matter because every all, the only thing that matters for this task is the head of this um, hand sanitizer. And as long as you can see that head, it's it's good enough. Um, so it's it's a, an interesting way of thinking about objects like um, uh, sort of the Gibsonian view where you're not trying to think about what is this shape, you know, what is it made of, but it's kind of like, what can you do with it, right? It's, um, you know, can I press the hand sanitizer? Um, yeah, you saw the wooden stick. Um, this is the drawer example uh, where you have to open the drawer and put stuff inside. Um, so the first action is kind of going, positioning yourself um, and slowly sort of opening it. and then pulling back. It's kind of very slow because I slowed it down for the visualization. Cool, um, any other questions on the results or the data collection setup? So, so I'm observing that a lot of the rotations are um, like we only observe like only certain um, types of rotations, for example, like the top down grass or like the left to right grass. Mm -hmm. um, 
it, are there like more tasks with like more variation in rotation or is it closer to yeah. and or so rotation modality? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so unfortunately, uh, since the real world tasks were all just, you know, collected by me and evaluated by me, I can't do a lot of diversity because it's just me doing all these experiments. Uh, but if you look at our website, which is, you know, prag.getup.io, uh, we have a bunch of simulated experiments where, you know, you turn, uh, you know, these taps, uh, you have to put these mugs on the thing, um, you have to sweep, uh, you have to open drawers, uh, so there's a lot more kind of six off kind of tasks, which involve um, a lot more sophistication than just in, you know, on a plane or something like that. So uh, this turn tap thing, I think is, um, so this is a single multitask policy. Uh, if you ask it to turn the other tap, um, yeah, this is the same thing. Um, yeah, this is slightly more six off ish um, than, you know, just top down and place. Uh, Thanks. How did you collect demonstrations for the simulation environments? Um, the simulation environments, they come with uh, synthetic uh, de demonstrations. Um, so there's a bunch of scripted demos that you can define. And the scripted demos are kind of basically the same, where you say, like, first go here, then here, then here. Um, so this is all part of the RL Bench framework by Stephen James et al. Uh, so if you go to our GitHub page, you can actually um, generate a bunch of new demos um, from the, the scripted um, system. Um, so yeah, I think there's a, let's see. Yeah, you can generate your own sort of data uh, based on kind of scripted demonstrations. Yeah. And um, just just being curious on the like, yes. time aspect yes. in the demonstration collection. Um, yes. Can you give a like, more of a high level view, like what would you like to change? So for instance, five demonstrations and hand sanitizer for 10 minutes, but there is um, eight demos with drawer, it's like 40 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, how does it look like also from the, from the simulation point of view, like how much of an effort should somebody put into Let's say script and like get a various uh, variety of trans, uh, demos, and also yeah. like something like related to that is like how um, how uh, related should these demos should be for a particular task? So yeah, so so related to demos, I think. Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, so. Generally, some tasks are easier because um, it's easier to use my interface, which is the joystick controller. Uh, some of them are extremely uh, hard to collect. So this one took about 60 minutes. It's simply because it's very hard to pick up this tiny piece of cardboard, uh, especially when you don't have good tactile feedback. It's hard to tell like how much to push and everything. Uh, so I think it, with, if you build a much, much better interface, uh, so, um, you're talking about what sort of things do you have to do when you're collecting the data. Um, so the system is kind of relatively robust to pose variations. Um, so if this hand sanitizer even is in like one location or two location, it doesn't matter. You could put it anywhere. You can put other distractor objects, uh, but you do need a good coverage of the things that you would potentially ask the robot to do. Um, so we are not still in a phase uh, uh, where we can sort of um, completely interact with novel objects. Um, so it, it will work maybe if you show a slightly different version of a hand sanitizer. But if you put a completely different drawer, which has like you know different types of openings, uh, it will completely fail. So you do still need a good coverage of the um, the sort of objects that you want to cover. Um, and I think it's also the same idea as sort of an object detection system. So if you want to train a good object detector, right, um, you want to have a good coverage of uh, you know cats, right? So you're not overfitting to this one type of cat. Um, and it's the same system here in the sense that it's de detecting actions. Um, so you just have to make sure that you have a broad enough diversity of uh, objects so that it doesn't kind of overfit on specific things. So there was a couple of questions coming. Yeah. Yes, go for it, go for it. Uh, one of them, I was just curious what your exact camera setup is. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question as well. Um, my exact camera setup was... Um, 
it sort of looks like this. So it's sort of, there's, uh, this angle is wrong, but like, you know, there's uh, a Kinect camera. Uh, we're just kind of pointing down. Actually, maybe it's more obvious in the paper. Um, if I go to the bottom of the appendix. Okay, yeah, this is it. Um, so there's a RGBD uh, Kinect camera over here. And then there's sort of a, an arm over there. Um, and then I have some hand-eye calibration based on this kind of AR marker over here. And then my other question is, when you were showing the like data collection in Arvis, it looked like the view in Arvis was kind of follow. Was it was it moving with the um, gripper marker? Ah, yes. Um, so this is a, a very simple trick that you can use. So this this uh, controller. Uh, this HTC Vive controller is just publishing six stop posts with respect to this kind of base station. So this base station has a camera here that's kind of tracking this controller. And then you can just, if you have good uh, hand-eye between you know, the Kinect and this uh, robot's action space, um, you can just visualize the Arvis marker, uh, which is simply the gripper, uh, to follow wherever your hand is going. So it kind of, it, you can sort of use the point cloud to sort of guide where the robot goes. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's all this is is just a simple Arvis marker that does this. Yeah. So the Arvis camera is following the marker. Oh yeah. Oh, so you're asking about the following. So this is a very cool trick in Arvis. So if you go to the top right, um, there's a follow mode. So you just turn on the follow mode, and it will try to follow any sort of frame that you give it. Um, so you just give it uh, a, a TF to follow. So in in Arvis, you have these trans TF trees. Uh, and then if you ask it to follow a specific TF tree, the camera will follow wherever you're going. Uh, this is a very simple trick. Just go to the top right and then click camera, follow, follow thing. Yeah. There is one more question. Yes. Uh, is there a tactile feedback on the gripper is the question. Um, no, yeah. So all of this is purely based on visual things. Um, so this is one of the weird things that, you know, humans rely a lot on tactile feedback, especially for precision, but um, here everything is just kind of purely visual. Uh, but yeah, that's something that in the future will probably be important. Yeah. So it's, it's okay, cool. cool. Yeah, go ahead, sir. How much it's open during the training phase, like how, how uh, wide or narrow the grippers are. And it's not yeah, so um, that's also another thing that's kind of abstracted away. The gripper only has two modes, which is closed or open. Um, but you could potentially sort of discretize that space as well. So you can think of uh, taking that action space, and if it's like 10 centimeters, you can discretize into like, you know, one centimeter bins. And then again, you can sort of predict um, sort of discrete actions the way you kind of predict um, this open and close. Uh, but right now, it's literally just binary. It's like either open or either close. Uh, and during execution, you reach the six off pose first, and then you execute open or close, uh, depending on the action. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if you can think of a clever way of discretizing everything, then you can just use the same framework without any modifications. Okay, cool. Um, so just some takeaways from this kind of case study. Um, so uh, this is something that kind of is so uh, ubiquitous in computer vision and NLP. So if you have looked at you know, computer vision and NLP systems, most of them are there kind of train, training one multitask model for everything. Um, this is kind of relatively not obvious in robotics. We always felt like we had to build systems for you know, every single specific task we do, uh, especially people thought it would be hard to do like you know, deformable objects, particles and everything, uh, but it might be possible to kind of use a similar paradigm in robotics. Um, the other thing is also the right problem formulation makes like a huge difference. Uh, we know transformers scale super well with a lot of data, uh, but also as we saw with that kind of pixel transformer, uh, you need to find that patch or the right tokenization for the transformer to exploit the, uh, the data. Um, so when you're thinking about using these kind of tools for robotics, uh, especially all the latest stuff like diffusion models, um, you think about what's the right problem formulation for sort of changing your input and your output so that it makes sense for our domain. Um, and lastly, um, this is kind of uh, a hope. It's, I don't have any empirical results for this, uh, but maybe whatever we call sort of tr traditional robotic perception, like you know, detecting objects and pose estimation, it might fall out of things that directly reason about actions, right? 
Um, so this is the same hand sanitizer model that kind of overfit to this um, head over here so that it's just predicting that. Um, so what I did at test time was kind of, I just picked another hand sanitizer. Um, I mean, it, it slightly looks same in the sense that it's the size is different, but at least the head looks very similar. Um, and it's sort of able to sort of uh, not accurately track it, but sort of still figure out what that means in, in this sort of cluttered scene. Um, and, you know, there's no explicit concept saying that, you know, that is a mug and that is a hand sanitizer, uh, whatever, and there's no implicit concept of object poses here. Uh, but maybe those things are kind of intermediate things that might fall out of these things. Um, just how like, you know, uh, these vision models and language models, they have some sort of implicit understanding of um, uh, what the perception space is and what the language space is, but that without explicitly using things like syntax or, um, you know, hand-coded features or something like that. Um, cool. Um, and I just want to end with some more results. So this is, again, uh, from another paper uh, that we will probably read later in this class. Uh, but it, this is just a 2D version of the thing that I was showing you. Uh, but it's it's a nice way of thinking about the same kind of uh, reason about actions, not objects. Um, so if you're, if you're folding this cloth in half, um, the only thing that you need to sort of think about is sort of how would you pick and then where would you place it? Um, so you can sort of fold things without having to sort of estimate the state of the scene um, or like unfold. Um, if you're moving chess pieces, um, again, uh, if you use a detection framework, you would have to detect every one of these squares. Uh, but if you just directly reason about where to pick and where to place, um, and you can kind of do this robustly even if you kind of perturb the, the chessboard. Um, this is the sweeping beans example I talked about. Um, uh, so generally particles are kind of very hard to represent. Uh, but this system is kind of very dumb in the sense that all it does is figure out where to start pushing and where to end pushing. And if you do this in kind of a reactive manner, um, things can fall out of range. So like, you know, when it hits this uh, thing over here, it like flies back, um, but it kind of is able to sort of sweep all these things on the side. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, ropes. Um, this is another example where uh, I was supposed to eat these cherries, but I accidentally dropped them. And then I thought I was like, oh, that would be a nice task for the robot. Uh, but the hard part is you can pick the cherries by the fruit because they will destroy the fruit. Um, uh, so what you do is you try to teach them to grab it by the stem. Um, and you can see like it can sort of see these stems in the detection. Um, and I made sure that I didn't you know, cherry pick any of these poses. So I threw these objects at the start of the video. Um, so that it, it's actually sort of figuring out uh, where the stems are. Yeah. Cool. Um, so uh, all of this is cool, but I, I still feel sometimes bad about completely ignoring the first perspective. Um, so the whole perspective that you know you have an image um, and then you process the stuff in the image to extract representations. Um, I don't want to say it's completely not useful for robotics uh, because uh, this clipboard paper actually uh, uses something like that. Uh, so clipboard is actually using uh, this model by OpenAI called Clip, uh, which is a model which trained on lots and lots of images and text. Uh, and it's trained to basically align encodings for this text and images uh, by just looking at lots and lots of pairs of you know, image and captions from the internet. Um, this is a pure you know, vision system that doesn't reason about actions. Uh, it doesn't know what the end, the end goal of the system is, uh, although it does have this caption. Uh, but it's it's a pure, you know, you know, we have an image, we're going to process the image, and we're going to extract representations. And I think this is still useful, uh, because when you do things like this, this is the same system uh, from Clipboard, uh, but now you want to read text, right, like handwritten text. Um, so I want to say, uh, put something in the good box or the bad box. Um, so Clip has somehow figured out how to do optical character recognition, um, or it can only recognize words. Um, so it can sort of understand what you mean when you say like, you know, put it in the good box or the bad box. Um, now, if you wanted to learn how to do this by collecting robot data, it would take years, right? Like even for humans, it takes like, you know, a few years for us to learn how to read text. Uh, but if you, if you look at, you know, all the text on the internet and on images, uh, you have a very good prior on what, you know, characters look like. Um, so you don't have to learn that from scratch. 
Um, so it is, you know, the uh, the whole fact of like, you know, processing an image and extracting representation, it still makes a lot of sense. Um, but, you know, going back to that kind of three perspectives on vision, um, if I were to sort of condense all the ideas that was presented in this lecture. Um, so if you have strong priors like clip, um, those are really good for, you know, extracting generalizable representations, uh, but they're definitely not sufficient for, you know, taking actions in the physical world. Um, so you need to combine them with some sort of affordances, right? So you're not just um, doing perceptions for perception's sake, but you're also connecting it back to somehow uh, to with actions. Um, and finally, uh, you can't just do things without, you know, uh, specific goals, uh, because a lot of perception, a lot of our kind of actions are directed by specific uh, intentions. Um, and if you kind of condition them on certain goals, um, you'll be much more generalizable than kind of overfitting to some, some specific task. Um, so this is kind of a way of sort of combining um, the three perspectives together. Um, and hopefully this is kind of useful uh, for you to think about these kind of problems. Uh, but if I were to summarize these things into a single sentence, um, this lecture is sort of, about, sort of about learning visual representations, uh, but not directly from objects, but also about actions um, and conditioned on language. Um, so if you don't remember anything else from this talk, but if you remember this, um, hopefully you will still you will be able to use it for certain things in your work. Um, cool. And if you're interested in playing with all these things, um, the simulated setup, the data, the code, um, everything is kind of publicly available. So you can go to prag.github.io. Um, there's a collab tutorial on how to implement it if you want to learn how to use it. Um, there's also clipboard stuff, uh, which is all this kind of 2D pick and place things. Um, the code models are all publicly available. Um, with that, I think I'll probably just stop here. And um, yeah, if uh, anybody has any questions, uh, happy to answer it. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mohit. Yeah, I suppose. So how do these models encode being done with the task? <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, so right now, um, the way that you uh, consider a task is done as an oracle or a human tells you that it's done, uh, which is kind of a, a way of uh, not actually solving the task completely. Uh, but there's a certain, there are a couple of ways of doing this. Um, so uh, in the real world, I had this thing where uh, if you go to a certain location on the tabletop, that's considered as an end action, right? So imagine you can pick this, like this as the, this corner of the table as your uh, end or your start action. Um, and then you can basically train the model to actually predict that end action at the sequence of, um, uh, of uh, actions that you predict. Um, so you just need something that indicates that, okay, I'm done with the task, I'm just gonna go over here. And then if that robot is over there, you say like, you're done with that. Um, you can also train sort of a classifier if you really want to. So you can train like an image classifier, which kind of says you're done with the task. Um, but for a lot of these simulated experiments, it, it was assumed that the Oracle will tell you when you're done. Uh, but that's a really good point because that's uh, uh, something that you have to deal with in the real world. There is one question uh, from the chat. So what are your thoughts on implicit 3D representations in robotics? Yeah, I think it's, um, I, I think implicit 3D representations are awesome. Um, I think explicit uh, 3D representations are kind of um, uh, very limited in the sense that you have to rely on these really good depth cameras uh, and these depth cameras are obviously limited in terms of like they can work on transparent objects and a lot of other places. Uh, but you know the latest stuff is all these implicit things, right? So like if you kind of use NERFs um, and if you use things like the instant NGP from NVIDIA, uh, you can get these uh, features from NERFs rather than come from like depth cameras. Uh, and if you do that, I think it's uh, it's uh, obviously going to be like you know super impactful for robotics. Um, but yeah, uh, in one word, yeah, implicit 3D is awesome, and I think we should work on it more. There is one question. So, uh, in case if uh, intermediate action fails, like will it proceed with the next step of actions, or uh, will it stop? Like in case if it proceeds like uh, to the end action, and uh, uh, say like in the middle, like you are placing a specific ball on a like you know inside a closed drawer or something, so. Will it again take back the whole uh, sentence to again, you know, check the like do the same sequence of action? So then it can't like, uh, the ball inside the drawer. Right? So the question is, what happens if the intermediate action fails? Does it will it? Return? Oh, 
What is the strategy? Oh, yeah. So, um, so this is, uh, uh, it's, it's, it can recover to some degree in the sense that there's sometimes when objects fall out of place um, in, in some of these examples. Let me see if I can find an example where that happens. Um, yeah, in so, so in some sense, um, yeah, you see like it, what happened in this point when it was trying to grab that second block. Um, let me see if I can play that back. Um, see, so it kind of like slipped out of reach. So there's some sort of reactive uh, thing in the sense that if objects slightly fall out of reach, they can sort of recover in some sense. Uh, but if it's like, you know, a ball that kind of rolls out of reach, I think that also happens in one of these uh, tasks where it, like something just falls out of hand. Um, okay, that worked. Let me see if I can, in one of these tasks, it kind of just drops the, the bottle and it falls down. Uh, okay, I can. <laughs> Let me see if I can get the ball to like roll down. Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that happens. So if that happens, it's hard to recover. Uh, but if it's just like a block that kind of falls out of reach, then it's it's possible. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we should head out because of, uh, of the class. So thank you again, Mohit. Thanks for doing this. Um,